I am a pulmonologist myself, but I'm uh, rarely telling I'm a pulmonologist here because the kind of things they do here, uh, tracheobronchial stunting, bronchial thermoplasty, vapor ablation, navigational bronchoscopy, and uh, you know, lung transplant, restenosis, uh, strictures, and all. I can also, I'm, I'm a stop telling myself as a pulmonologist. All of our pulmonologists are doing an excellent job all over the country. Yesho in particular, anywhere they'll blindly say that Yesho the pulmonary, they'll do a fellowship even if they need to pay something also. Critical care too, like uh, we had 200 patients on ventilator first wave. Second wave, we had uh, 109 air ambulance transfers. We did 35 lung transplants first time when we started. Liver too, we are doing 15 to 20 transplants. Uh, but uh, in general, things I'm um, pleasantly surprised. By the time uh, when I went to US 2009, uh, it's a liver transplant done somewhere in the US, that kind of thing. But uh, coming back now, we are doing 15 to 20 liver transplants every month. and. Uh, 25 ECMOs simultaneously we could run in during this uh, second wave also simultaneously and uh, all these things average hospital in US is also not doing so we are doing uh, good things uh, critical care too we have a Venkat Kola and all we have a webinar uh, attended Pan India now every Tuesday evening uh, uh, it's going on with all the Pranip Gulen and all the leading uh, luminaries from the Pan India also participating so uh, on stage too Suresh and all if you can uh, Take this further forward to we have all the leading luminaries here. We'll uh, not only do this physical uh, conferences, any other kind of help we need from Yashoda management side, we'll always be willing to support them. And uh, thank you. So I think uh, it's enough of your time. Happy Doctor's Day. At least one day we have to relax. You can do whatever today. Yeah, you can see that how the arm is uh, uh, rotated like that because the patient is having a fracture shaft of the humerus. 99.9% .9 most of the pediatric injuries, unless otherwise they are indicated, they are conservative by conservative, they are treated by conservative management. You may see as a parents, they get disheartened to look at the fracture because fracture is a day-to-day -day affair to us as a doctors. For them, it is related with more of emotion. Even the smallest fracture will really upset them or really bother them. But if you see a fracture, how the physiology of the fracture, how it is going to heal over a period, if you take a series of x-rays, even without doing anything, except giving a small splint, Splint means in orthopedics, we have an iron rod which we apply to the limb or a plaster, we give it. But here, even if putting a small adhesive plaster, if it's a fracture shaft femur, you put a small, uh, what you call that, uh, plaster, the sticking plaster, attach it to the thigh and that brought to the abdomen and uh, stick to that abdomen that itself will act as a splint and the fracture unites so nicely without any problem. You can see how the fracture day one, day, day four, within one week, you can see a lot of good calluses form, fracture started uniting. And at the end of two weeks, the fracture unites like this. Just before coming to this, I was discussing with my, my colleague, another associate, Mind. Why, though there is a overriding of the fracture, here you can see almost 2 centimeters overriding is there. If it is seen in adults, you will definitely, at the end of the fracture healing, you see the limb length discrepancy because there will be shortening of the limb. Whereas in children, luckily, the periosteum is more thicker than the bone per se. And because of hyperemia, there is a more callus and there will be no uh, the limb length discrepancy. You can see that how the fracture was and how it healed. You can't even recognize that there was a fracture six months back unless that radiologist is too good. Uh, the next fracture is the clavicle fracture. You can see that. You can see the clavicle. It's the most frequently bone injury, unpredictable, unavoidable complication of the normal birth, present with the pseudo paralysis late with the swelling. Many a time, the patient comes and at our parents bring the patient, doctor, my child is not moving the limb. Is it a paralysis? I'm sure 
90 percent of the doctors when they see it looks the child doesn't move the limb even for one uh, centimeter at first glance we think it is a paralysis unless we thoroughly examine the patient look at the clavicle site see there is a crepitus there is a swelling patient winces when you touch the fracture site many a time we miss he said that okay i think patient is having some paralysis or maybe herbs palsy you please take it to neurologist or neurosurgeon but after five days patient starts moving the limb without anything and especially children once the fracture gets stabilized by a calcifer this bone callus formation the pain disappears patient moves the hand and uh, without any uh, pain they will move and uh, you think patient has recovered from the nerve injury but if you carefully examine there was a fracture which most of us miss it and when there is a fracture always there will be a crepitus patient will cry with you know uh, pain when you touch it there will be an abnormality in the sense of there will be a projection of the bone with fracture ends when it is like this there is no problem you can see the normal skin but when there is a fracture the fracture ends try to you know poke the skin or they are in different position there will be some angulation or one fracture segment is more low the other fracture is more up so that you can see the skin is popping up or sometimes you may see some uh, information changes around the fracture and especially when there is a fracture clavicle patient will have a sternocleidomastoid spasm patient will not try you know he will hold the neck very rigid and again this is a fracture a very common fracture what we see in the children is a fracture in the supracondylar area you can't appreciate patient will cry you can see the small fracture you can see the small fracture first x-ray you may miss it not you most of the people miss it but when you touch it patient will cry and there will be patient will be reluctant to move the when you try to move the elbow also patient will have the pain and if you take an x-ray you don't appreciate but i always advise you should take a second x-ray at the end of one week especially in the old people if you take an x-ray which the fracture is not since the day one if you take an x-ray at the end of three weeks or four weeks you can see a callus formation what we call hairline fractures we many a time we miss it unless we are very good in radiology especially many children if you take an x-ray at the end of one week you can see the signs of uh, the callus formation this is the supracondylar fracture or sometimes you may have a epiphyseal injury as well which are very very dangerous supracondylar fractures will unless it is treated properly either by conservative management or pinning they will have a deformity in the elbow joint you know the cubitus valgus and cubitus varus deformity and if it is an epiphyseal injury if there is a problem the patient will have a stunted growth because the growth plate is injured and patient will have a uh, difference of growth between the normal part and abnormal part patient will have a deformity at the end of one year or two years so identifying an epiphyseal injury is very very crucial otherwise the patient will have problem and sometimes you don't need to do anything if it's a green stick fracture that is uh, you know green stick fracture is is a, a soft uh, you know like that if you have a, a bone if it's a brittle if you break you will see the crack whereas in um, children many a time you don't see a classical fracture but you can see a buckling because you have a thick periosteum you don't see you don't appreciate the fracture but you can see that there is a mild bent and you can see the fracture that kind of patients can be treated with a small splint like that they are available in the market in any medical shop you just give them wrap them because you have given the splint the patient will be comfortable after three days four days you can see baby is happily playing and i told you is another fracture 
fracture femur. Initially, I was telling, when there is a fracture, you don't have to do any special splint or something like that. Whatever the available sticking plaster that is available, you wrap around the thigh and stick to the abdomen. And see, day one, after one week, after one month, six weeks, because of the hyperemia at the fracture set in children, the fracture unites so well, you don't, you can't even differentiate that patient had a fracture 10 months back. And sometimes if the fracture is, and uh, the patients are very concerned, some people think that, why doctor, you are putting only strapping, we are worried fracture may unite or not. And they bother, really bother uh, us. For that kind of patient, we give this uh, harness brace. So that will keep the uh, hip inflection and the knee, the hip and knee inflection, and they bring the fracture set, uh, both the fractures near alignment, and that acts as a splint that will allow the, um, the micro movements at the fracture site that will fasten the movement, that will fasten the fracture healing. And birth injuries again, sterno pleo when you pull with the forceps or something like that, many a time, patient after birth, you see the neck is put in a very rigid position. You try to move the head, they wince or they cry because of the pain. This is none other than sternocleidomastoid injury per se, other than secondary to clavicular fracture. That, in that case, you have to do a Physical examination is a mandatory. Radiograph for cervical spine. 99.99 percent, there will be no cervical spine injury. The best way to identify a sternocleidomastoid injury is an ultrasonography. That will give a 100 percent proven result. This simple, you have to if you the patient is have proved to have a sternocleidomastoid injury, you have to have ice application like a crocin drops or something, paracetamol drops or like that. After one week or two weeks, once the inflammation comes down, you start stretching the neck. I think usually you tell the mother to do a simple thing. You don't, it's not a big job. A simple stretching, just to move the neck, right side, left side, front, back, front like that. That will settle and that will uh, not allow the muscle to contract and they will not have a torticollis or something like that. By chance, if the parents are not that educated, they are afraid of doing this uh, stretching exercises, the patient may land in a problem known as torticollis. For that, you may need a small surgery called, uh, you know, release of the soft tissue at the end of two years. And this is quite interesting. I don't call it, it is OBPA. I will tell you. We call it as newborn, uh, this uh, flexus, uh, nerve, nerve injury, neonatal brachial flexus injury. Especially, it is quite common to see when the baby is delivered by forceps. Sometimes even a normal delivery, when you pull the fetal head like that with the, uh, more, uh, you know, violently, they may have the brachial plexus injury. The magnitude of the problem is 1.5 to 3% of out of 1000 vaginal deliveries. Incident is not changed despite the increase the rate of the cesarean uh, sections. We don't know why. Is it because the fetus is not handled properly while doing the cesarean section? We don't know. But the incidence rate is 1.5 to 3% for uh, th three cases out of 1,000 uh, deliveries. The serve policy of 32 years of practice, I have not seen more than 10% uh, recovery. Sorry to say this. Having so much of... Uh, development in neurology and pediatric neurologists. I don't know, unfortunate. I see, when I see this patient with Dalf palsy, I, that day I 
get depressed. Just because it is a teratogenic, you should be very, very gentle while doing the delivery, while application of the forceps and evaluation of the baby is very, very important immediately after the delivery. And that person has a permanent weakness, as I said. I have seen hundreds of cases of last 32 years of my practice and hundreds of bowel palsies. And the moment I see, I know this is not my uh, you know, subject. I immediately refer to a neurologist. At that time, there were very less neurologists. Now we have a pediatric neurologist as well. Nowadays, we have plastic surgeons. So if that has to be repaired, they are repairing. But original still, it, it needs a lot of physical therapy, a lot of counseling, and a lot of rehabilitation is necessary. Still, the results are not that encouraging. We hope that uh, somebody will find an answer for that. When you come to Elf's palsy, there are many varieties of Elf's palsy. A simple Elf's palsy, which is a transient, like uh, I graded according to the root level, C5, C6, there will be no elbow flexion. C5, C7, no elbow flexion and no extension. C5 to T1, no elbow flexion, no extension and a poor hand function. We always call it as a policeman hands or bar tip. You know, bar tenders, server, what do they call it? They put your hand for the tip. That's the tip. Usually you call it as a policeman hand. So it is very popular. And the next fourth category is C5 to T1 where you have a almost nil upper limb function plus a Horner syndrome. This is just a uh, pictorial presentation. I just did it like that. From C5 to T1, you can see the dove palsy, hand, wrist and functional. 90% of the people, if it is a must to have a palsy, I wish to have this. Because in this 90% spontaneous recovery is there. When you have up to C5 to C7, the wrist and the digital extension, this is a waiter's tip. The prognosis is very, very poor. And the flay limb, that's a poorer diagnosis. When you involve all the things, you have the flay limb, just the limb moves like this. And uh, for you to understand a very easy way, especially if the postgraduates are there, of course, not that uh, they don't know. It's a neuropraxia, a small stretch of the nerve or root. The recovery is in six weeks, 90%. If this is an axonal nerve disease, you can see the recovery will be around six to nine months. When it's a neurotemesis, which is incomplete, the recovery also incomplete, and 90% will be there, the recovery. But when you have a root evolution, the result is no recovery. I told you how the uh, Horner syndrome looks like. You can see the one side, the pupil is completely dilated. The other side is uh, pupil is constricted. And you can see the how the baby, though she is cheerful, how the limb is uh, hold, uh, held like that. These people will have early signs of root evolution and flexus rupture. One is the sympathetic chain affected, that is Horner syndrome. Some people will have the diaphragm, half of the diaphragm is paralyzed and the scapula is, you know, flyer. That means the people come with the high riding scapula, it's a winging scapula. The indications for uh, neurosurgery, of course, I am not authority, just for completion's sake, uh, I just put it like that. I think Dr. Sishkant is the right person uh, to talk about that. The variable depending on the center, surgeon and family. Some people, but any cause they want to get it done. Some surgeons, they don't want to do however big they are, because they know that this. most of us are result-oriented doctors. We are the private practitioners, we want the results. So I think that, why unnecessarily touching the case and getting the bad name? Is that okay? Ignore the case. And depending on the center, whatever may be the center, an institute like Ashoda, we try our best and leave it to the God. We treat, he cures. I will come to this. An evolution injury without potential for spontaneous recovery, 
A rupture injury with the insufficient recovery for anti gravity strength. Timing variable at uh, you know, but most agree the avulsion should be treated at the end of three months and the rupture should be treated at the end of five to six months. Narrow transfers are changing timing indications. It is a dynamic operation. People, some people say that we operated five, nine months, uh, we operated 15 months, some people say that we operated six months like that. There is a lot of discussion is going on about this and it has not uh, come to a uh, uh, conclusion actually. So it uh, depends on the surgeon's beliefs and fancies. In conclusion, a recognition of a trauma necessitates a careful physical and neurological evaluation of the infant to establish whether additional injuries exist or not. Occasionally, injuries also may result from resuscitation when the patient is having a problem. When you try to resist the patient, when you are strong enough to break the pediatric uh, patient that ribs, patient will have multiple rib fractures. Patient will worsen just because of the injuries while we try to save the patient. And one more thing uh, which I did not include was pulled elbow. Many a time, the children, parents are uh, relatives, what happens, they try to pull the child like that with, uh, uh, you know, extended hand like that. What happens, the radial head, which is there in the annular ligament of the, uh, this one, in the elbow joint, that gets ruptured or dislocated. Patient will cry, cry, cry. We don't understand why the patient, because we are sure that patient had not fallen. Patient did not hurt himself, no fever, and uh, he said that he just cry. You ask him to move the hand, he doesn't move. I have seen many a patients, many periods bring the patient at the end of 72 hours, 98 hours like that. Doctor, we don't know. We checked uh, our boy, our baby, crying continuously. And he is not allowing us to touch the elbow joint. We are sure that patient has not fallen anywhere. And you see the patient, patient will keep the hand straight. He doesn't allow you. He doesn't even raise the hand like that. The simple technique, if one of you can come, I will just uh, demonstrate, which is a 30 seconds procedure. Any one of you can volunteer? Patient, but don't worry. Just hold it like that. Put your thumb on the radial head and do like this. For sudden click, you will appreciate a click underneath your thumb. That means the radial head, which is subluxated from the annular ligament, gets relocated. Mind you, within 10 seconds, the patient will stop crying. Just because he suffered for four days, three days, or two days, you ask him to extend the elbow, he is afraid because subconsciously it is printed that he is having the pain and he doesn't uh, move. Don't worry. Make the parents to sit in your chamber, try to talk something, some conversation. Tell the parents to just give a pen or chocolate or something to pick it up. He will first hesitate. After that, he will start and take a pen, ask him to just touch it. You parent, ask the parent to take the pen and ask the uh, child to hold the pen. So initially, he hesitated because he had a pain for almost so many hours, so many days. And gradually, he will try to touch, uh, you know, grab the pen and ask him to elevate that, uh, you know, raise the hand up. This boy, child also raises his hand, picks up. And believe it or not, Parents appreciate you like anything. Doctor, I don't know what the magic you did. We could not do anything. For the last 72 hours, he was distractly crying. I don't know what is there in your hand. It is, uh, I mean, really, you see goose and bumps when the patient plays just like this for nothing. It is a small uh, five seconds trick where the radial head got subluxated from the annular ligament. You relocate it, the pain disappears. You don't require anything. You don't need to put a plaster. You don't need to give any sling. Just give, tell them to give a crocin. If the two, too young, pediatric drops of crocin 
and if you're an adult you give us some uh, ibuprofen and syrup or something like that if you are too conscious about that tell them to apply some ice or something that's all forget it. that's it next red is sometimes light red these orthopedic infections are very very dangerous any soft tissue in injury or an early childhood is a predisposing factor for acute osteomyelitis classical history patient comes to a pediatrician after 3 days or 4 days doctor my child is having a high temperature after 103 104 crying continuously not allowing me to touch his thigh or hip joint or leg or elbow whatever it may be he had a, you take the history that yes doctor he had a fall while playing or while just from my lap he had a fall and i checked there was no fracture and he also did not for only 5 10 minutes he cried and uh, i did not even bothered much because he was not telling anything but uh, i am sure that he sustained injury there there only he has a swelling patient is not allowing me to touch continuously crying not allowing the move, you know limb to move, you know not moving the limb even a 1 cm that is where you have to suspect acute osteomyelitis because when there is a soft tissue injury the blood gets accumulated children child infant or child means invariably they will have some cold cough or something like that this blood where it got accumulated near the injury that attracts it acts like a nidus it attracts the bacteria from the uh, infection site like ear or throat or somewhere like that or sinus that to go through the blood stream and sit there it multiplies and it converts as acute osteomyelitis sometimes if you miss the osteomyelitis acute osteomyelitis it will be a chronic it will be converted as a chronic osteomyelitis sometimes if the patient is debilitating or immunologically poor we may lose the patient of course nowadays we are not seeing that many cases when i was a postgraduate way back in the early late 90 late 80s we used to have so many osteomyelitis cases the classical history and that of the postgraduate study where i did was a uh, very poor area so that we used to have a lot of osteomyelitis cases because of the poor poor you know uh, hygienic and all if you take them to the theater open i used to get at least 100 ml of frank pus by the time the pus the infection invades the periosteum and uh, there will be periosteal reaction if this is not properly cleaned washed and proper antibiotic are not given the osteomyelitis cases have turned into chronic osteomyelitis it to the hip joint injury to the knee joint which are very common patient develop initially they will have an hemarthrosis because of infection elsewhere in the body that will convert as a septic arthritis which is again a dreaded complication in anybody's orthopedic practice once the septic arthritis is established you can take it for granted this patient will have a um, defect uh, affected joint forever once the pus is in the joint for more than 6 hours it will invade the synovium uh, uh, what do you call cartilage it will damage permanently initially it may look normal to you but you will see the erosion of the cartilage after few months patient will come limping doctor i had <coughs> septic arthritis <coughs> my boy had a septic arthritis this got drained but the patient still limping if you take an x ray if you are a good radi- you have a good radiology background <coughs> you will appreciate the narrowing of the joint space or moth eaten appearance of the um, ends of the femur or tibia if you don't uh, appreciate that uh, damage better go for an ultrasound or go for an mri you can see a uh, damage of the cartilage is a knee joint it's only a pain or a mild deformity whereas if it happens in the hip joint the infection will eat away the head within days time and patient will have a pathological subluxation or dislocation of the hip joint and patient will become permanently handicapped so please 
if you suspect an osteomyelitis or a septic arthritis straight away start the antibiotic refer to a surgeon who will take care of who will drain out the pus and save the baby's leg the take home message is patient education about the fall and uh, don't neglect the fall see is there any contusion or is there any fever is there any pain like that and evaluation of the patient when they come to the outpatient department of a pediatric or orthopedics that is the key to avoid all the above said complications this uh, one slide i got it late the dysplastic uh, hip you can see we are seeing only tip of the iceberg only these things we are seeing this more than 90% of cases we are not seeing them because they are not complaining unless the parents are smart enough and we see when the patient is adolescent doctor i don't know why my son is limping or uh, they say no doctor i see my son's or daughter's one limb is little short the family instance of this ddh and cdh if the patient is having one sibling is having out of seven one will have the another sibling also will have this problem out of seven siblings sorry if one parent is having if eight parents out take one out of them one parent will have a sibling who will have this cdh and one parent one children one sibling is having in that one in three and second degree relative is the knees are the abuse one in 100 the patients at this car first born child is a female child the increased risk at four to six times fracture breach increases to risk to five to ten times in the family history increases risk at ten times is the facial asymmetry like torticollis or like that the risk is around 20 to 10 to 20% a foot deformities like calcaneo valgus or metatarsus erectus again these are all predisposing factors fluid around the patients oligohydramnus and the fetal anamnesis especially the teratologic type if you want to evaluate whether the patient is having a ddh or cdh the infant should be quiet and comfortable look for any shortening of the limb and you can see the glue you know a uh, wide perineum and the lateral you can see the counter is gone and the by if it's a bilateral the perineum is wide and asymmetric trifold see here one fold is like that another thigh trifold is like that if you examine clinically you can see the groin is empty and because the femoral artery is not before the bony support the femoral of pulse is very weak though it is normal <coughs> you can see that limited hip abduction inflection and hip instability this is the ortholony test and see how the limb get subluxated when you push it like that it goes down and the release abduct it that sits in the groove and again barlos again you have to the actor the video is not playing and again you can see that abduct wide widen the thighs and push with the uh, your thumb the greater chorosity greater trochanter and uh, see that how it gets uh, uh, coming out of the uh, estabulum and see it is you press it down it gets uh, dislodged from the joint socket it going down uh, this is the Uh, presentation, picture presentation of that uh, 
Ortoloni and Barlos. You will be able to see the cluck sound if you are clinically examination, examine the patient. When to do the ultrasound? Many a time people think that MRI is the only answer for most of these problems. No. If you have a good radiologist, ultrasound is one of the best gadget to have a proper muscular cutaneous disorders. If hip is normal, you don't require. If hip is really unstable, like you did the Ortolani test or Barlow's test, again you don't require an ultrasound test. Because it is already proven with the clinical acumen, you are proving that a patient is having the DDH, this one. And if the patient is suspicious, like he is having a, um, as I said, the clinical examination, he is having the abnormal folds, the lateral surface of the thigh is, you know, flat, the counter is lost. If you suspect that, though you have done a test, still if you are feeling that patient is having a problem, better go for an ultrasound without any station. And if the patient is having any history, like this fact, what I told you, primary female patient and all, again, you require an ultrasound uh, examination. This is the femoral head, and this is the cartilage of the acerbulum, labrum, capsule, electrophocator, and this one. This will be, uh, you can see that it has come out of the cavity. You can see that. The aim of the CDH is, of course, the pediatricians, once they find it's a DDH or CDH, they refer to an orthopedic surgeon. And just for complete intake, I put it like this. Obtain and maintain the constant direction. The head should be in the establishment properly. In uh, a traumatic fashion, it doesn't mean that you have to force the head into the establishment and the force will keep that. That will uh, damage the uh, vasculite of the femoral head. If it's an uh, unstable hip, observation or uh, this harness, uh, pavlic harness, subluxated hip, it's a pavlic harness or the hip spike attached. Nowadays, very old people are very serious, they're applying the hip spiker because uh, applying a hip spiker is an art. If it's a dislocated hip, dislocated hip, reduce and hold it with the again spiker. As a catalogic hip surgery, if it's not reduceable, sometimes there will be a soft tissue interposition if you can't, um, so that you can't reduce the hip. That time you have to open it, reduce the hip, put it a simple K wires, put it a you know hip spica that will take care of that. By that at the end of six weeks to ten weeks, the soft tissue develops around the hip joint and uh, it will see that it won't get uh, subluxated or this. This is how the pavlic harness is can be used even for the fracture females. And the CTV again, when it comes, of course, it's not an emergency, but the people used to come after six months and they have so many bits, it gets corrected on its own, and uh, it's God's gift, it's for luck and all. Those days have gone. Now, the there are four main components. One is Chaos at the midfoot, adduction at the forefoot, wares at the hind foot, equinus at the hind foot. You can see that. This is how a CTV, how the club, you have seen the people playing the goal, the club. And again, diagnosis, idiopathic, neurogenic syndrome. And uh, putting plaster CTV is one of the finest techniques. If an orthopedic surgeon, if you Say that the orthopedic surgeon is good. That means he must be knowing uh, putting a good plaster. This is called positive plaster technique. A simple stage one, we put like that. Every <coughs> week we change the plaster. I know a lot of uh, time is wasted. For the parents, they have to travel a lot, they have to spend a lot every time plaster and all. Sometimes the patient is not cooperative, we have to give some sedation. If we are worried about the sedation, we have to give anesthesia and do the plaster. After putting the plaster, if the patient is too active, the plaster may come out. You put the plaster, you go for rounds, so come and see the baby, you see that his plaster is out of his leg. So how the CTV, exactly bilateral CTV looks like, because the video is not playing. Uh, 
the one in live was uh, the first born, bilateral deformities occur in 50 percent, and the two is to one percent, the male to female. And again, I told you the family is this of uh, this one, one sibling, uh, one in 35, and one parent, one in 30, both the parents, one in three. So of course, there I told you there are seven steps to put correction. I already I told you, for safety, a gentle manipulation. Uh, this anyway, I, I don't think this is useful for you people. Only thing is, anyway, you diagnose and the patient was, it won't help. That I just, but I put it for completion sake. Thank you for your uh, patience. Thank you. Most commonly, small, small cuts where we don't know whether to do a uh, staple, which is, I don't say staple, because uh, as a plastic surgeon, uh, we generally don't use staples and that too on uh, kids, it's like, uh, uh, using a gunny uh, or you know, uh, uh, what, what are, uh, purikosa, you know, like that, that. Using that for a gunny bag, we feel that like that. So, generally, we don't use staples. Either you apply glue or sutures. These are the only two things which most of the plastic surgeons, I would say, 99.9% .9 of plastic surgeons use it. So, so generally, most common type of injuries are trauma. What we see in our OPD, like uh, cuts, abrasions and uh, uh, whatever that is and also some fingertip injuries and sometimes fingertip crush similarly and the other most common injuries in opd emergencies is burns most commonly small superficial hot water scalds that is uh, what we see and also and as dr uh, dasaram redigaru uh, spoke soft tissue infection this is also very important things which we should see in uh, OPD basis, we should be able to identify the conditions where uh, negligence or if you neglect it or if you oversee it, I would say that's the right uh, word. If you oversee it, you might, uh, that patient might land up in some complications at a later date. So that is where uh, your soft tissue infections and uh, come into the picture. So most of the cuts are like that. Like uh, here, it's a little bit more uh, uh, deeper here, where orbicularis or is, uh, oculus muscle is also getting uh, uh, prolapsed out. Uh, similarly, you have burns like this. Predominantly, what you can deal with in your OPD practice is superficial burns and uh, like this. And fingertip injuries like this, the fingertip, uh, small fingertip aversions, and to some extent, sometimes, fingertip crush injuries along with avulsion where you the whole skin will be avulsed where it's difficult to uh, replant or uh, difficult to reconstruct so and soft tissue infections like this with swelling and sometimes they get as a they will be associated with uh, compartment syndrome that is where uh, the recognition of the uh, compartment syndrome is important for you to uh, uh, identify so that you can refer to the uh, surgical surgeon so that he can do some face shot means and release the pus and so that they won't be able to you know expand extend to the nearest joint leading to osteomyelitis or uh, chronic infection may cause fibrosis of the local muscles and causes contracture muscle uh, contractures of the muscles leading to deformities of the joint at a later age so that is where uh, your discretion comes into the picture so how to manage all these things? How to manage all these cuts? So when you see a, a child with a cut, like a forehead cut, I would say here, uh, if you see here, you get a small chin cut uh, like this or a small hand cut like this or sometimes a small uh, uh, cut on the similar cut like as it is, in, is on the chin on the forehead. So you have to imagine what are the structures that are there beneath the skin? So, for example, on the forehead, you have skin beneath it, you have a frontalis muscle as well as the perios bone. So, if the cut is, uh, most of the times what happens is, in that uh, small, small cuts, uh, the, uh, the underlying frontalis muscle and the dermis and everything will get cut. So, and uh, the natural tendency of the skin is to contract. So, if you do the dressing and send them, it will contract. But over the period of time, the muscle gets retracted and the wound gets opened and there will be a collection beneath it which get infected and it will 
come out as a pus so this is uh, so assessing the depth of the wound is very important so if you just when the child comes you just uh, hold the edges and just split it up and if you see a full opening and if you are able to see the underlying muscle and everything you better not put a glue there because glue it uh, holds your only epidermis whereas uh, the underlying muscle or the dermal dermal or subcutaneous fat this will not be held by the glue so over the period of time if you apply glue there your epidermis will uh, uh, get or i would say if it will give a false appearance of getting healed but uh, the underlying space between uh, beneath the epidermis where the muscles are retracted they get uh, they will have a collection there and next after two or three days you just uh, that uh, uh, epidermal adhesions will open up and they cause uh, uh, it gives the appearance of an infected wound to the child the parents so then they come running to you sir this is uh, open so the glue is not work so it's not that glue did not work it's because a wrong uh, choice of our application of glue leads to uh, uh, this uh, situation so the most important thing especially when you are uh, uh, applying a glue onto the child laceration is just to open up and see if possible so if it opens up completely and if you are able to see the underlying uh, muscle or anything then better it's a uh, suturing is a better option for that rather than application of glue so it's like that so similarly the burns in burns also if it is a superficial burns superficial burns is generally before that i would like to go uh, give you a small uh, uh, idea about the anatomy of the skin here you have generally epidermis dermis and subcutaneous tissue this is the crux of all our assessment in either sutures or burns uh, or whatever all the other uh, immediate uh, pediatric skin emergencies so so as i told you before the uh, when you are uh, going for a uh, assessment of the uh, cut wounds you just have to see see if the dermis is also cut if this part dermis is also cut that uh, it is unlikely that the glue is going to work similarly in case of burns so in burns also uh, we have uh, multiple classifications of burns like grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 which i am going to cover in the next uh, few slides so we have in early stage we have uh, we manage it with the occlusive dressings mm. occlusive dressing means simple you close the wound apply uh, uh, an antibiotic ointment close the wound with a gauze or a small uh, uh, dressing and uh, that's and keep regularly changing the dressing in a day or two it will heal this mostly applies to uh, superficial burns the burns as the burns become more deeper so your management changes we use uh, for uh, second uh, early uh, grade two burns we use uh, collagen grafting collagen grafting is we apply collagen which even if the if you feel that it is a little bit deeper in this small wound where is a small maybe around uh, one 3 or 4 cm of wound you can just clean the wound and apply a small uh, 5 into 5 or a 10 into 10 cm collagen you get a collagen small collagen grafts outside so you can just apply the collagen wash it the wound and apply a collagen there itself so it's a, a soothing it gets stuck to the uh, the dermis and uh, Uh, the, and gets adhered to the dermis, and once the dermis, uh, the re regeneration of the epidermis happens, this uh, collagen will peel off. So similarly, uh, but if as uh, burns go become deeper, so you have to uh, refer it to a further management for a, a surgeon, plastic surgeon, so that he will uh, go for other further management like what we do in excision and skin grafting or a flap or depending on the depth of depth of the burns. Similarly, in infections also. so you have to where uh, real uh, evaluate and uh, see the uh, extent of the infection so if the infection is small su uh, superficial soft tissue infection can be managed by regular dressings or just extirpation of pus or anything but if uh, if you feel that there is an uh, swelling is there with the restriction of the mobility on the either side of the joints he is unable to the most important feature of a compartment syndrome is the restriction of the uh, movements or i would say the passive movements so for example in an elbow in a forearm if there is a compartment syndrome 
So on passive extension of uh, uh, wrist joint, passive extension of wrist joint can cause severe pain in the flexor compartment of the forearm. So that is because when you are uh, extending the passive stretch that is applied onto the flexor muscles, uh, that causes an increase in the pressure in the uh, compartment and causes pain. So that is a classical feature where uh, we should uh, uh, plan for a release of the compartment because the skin necrosis or the pulses are last to be they are the last to be obliterated in case of a compartment syndrome by the time the pulses disappear the muscle damage has been occurred already so and muscle damage in childhood leads to fibrosis of the muscles and causes contractures and uh, contractures leads to further damage of uh, the growth because the growth doesn't stop these joints will um, the, the, when the bone grows, they grow in a wrong direction and all the, uh, uh, cur uh, the curvatural deformities of the bone happen there. In case of cuts, if it is a deeper cut, you need proper debridement and repair uh, like what we have done here. Similarly, here in the other child, there was a uh, uh, what you call prolapse of the orbicularis muscle and uh, so which we had to repair that muscle as well as we have to close the skin. Sometimes we get wounds like this, uh, where it's been sutured outside with a big, big sutures. So some, uh, see, proper uh, opening of the sutures, opening up of the sutures, proper evaluation of the defect, and uh, layer by layer closure, approximating every layer. So this is how uh, a good closure results in. So we may not be able to see the suture line also. So as I told, deep cuts, they need proper debridement and evaluation as I told you before. We have to evaluate, we have to spread the uh, skin to see whether the underlying uh, muscle and these are visible or they might be cut, everything. So that's where our uh, evaluation comes and uh, that's where our uh, discretion comes in applying the glue. So I'll, I'll just have, a, most of you must have, uh, because of this. So I have a small, uh, video that we have taken it from yesterday, it might appear rustic, but uh, that's... Uh... So now we are suturing the skin, subcutical sutures of the skin. I am going to take bites from either side of the skin, the subcutical layers like this. I'll take only dermis from here and here. And I'll take the bite from the other side, from the point of exit on this side. So from exit and entry will be at the same level, so that the skin won't be, skin won't get crumpled because of close roots like a gun bag. See, this is where uh, we generally approximate. So, before application of glue also, if it's a deeper wound, we should uh, close the dermis and subcutaneous tissue and then apply a glue over it. So, that will give you a better applied, uh, results. Uh, actually, this has gone now. The previous one will be better here. So, next comes to our fingertip injuries. So fingertip injuries are most commonly what you receive is, uh, what you see is uh, this fingertip injuries, uh, the tip amputation. So here, these, uh, these fingertips are generally amputated. We cannot uh, just uh, repair this, we cannot close. If we want to close, we have to uh, ampute, we have to further uh, trim the exposed bone and distal phalanx and then close it, which causes uh, decrease in the size of the uh, finger uh, distal phalanx. So what we do is a small VY advancement flap where we advance uh, a V-shaped advancement uh, from here and we advance this flap till the tip of it and that's how it is. So we almost restore the whole length of the phalanx without causing any decrease in the length. So fingertip injury should always be uh, repaired in a proper VY advancement flap or any other flap closure because the in, off late fingertips have become very important. So many of them, many of us, uh, many of the people, children, they grow and become, they become software engineers where their application of your uh, 
computer work and their, the their uh, tactile sensations and the tactile discrimination and all these things are important. So that is where we have to repair fingertips. Sometimes we go to even to an extent of small uh, to replace this fingertip. We go for a thinner flap here where we uh, replace the skin of uh, a fingertip with the same similar skin. So that is where uh, fingertip repair is very important no, uh, nowadays. We should replace the like tissue with the like. Next comes we deal with burns. In burns, as I told you before, we generally uh, classify burns into grade 1, 2, 3, 4 or first degree, second degree, third degree. First degree is absolutely superficial which involves only epidermis, which is only epidermis, this part. Whereas the second degree burns or grade 2 and 3 burns, uh, they involve part of the dermis. Grade 2 burns or uh, superficial second degree burns, they involve part of the dermis. Whereas uh, the deeper uh, complete grade 2 burns involve all of the dermis almost with some remnant. So these are the burns where we appear, uh, which appear uh, many a times uh, on the borderline. We think that they appear like uh, superficial burns, especially grade 2 year burns, where uh, we tend to go for uh, regular dressings. Yes, they heal. Everything, every burns will heal ultimately. Either they heal by epithelization or they heal by formation of fibrosis and contractures. So most all burns will heal. Everything will heal by itself. But... They will give you either a bad fibrous scar along with a contracture or they heal by itself. If it is a superficial burn, most of them they heal um, grade 1 with loss of epidermis less than 48 hours to 72 hours, they become painless and they heal. The more deeper, the grade 2A burns, they also heal. Within a 7 days they heal. But they give a small hypopigmented patch or a, a small uh, uh, fibrotic patch. Whereas if it is a grade 2 B or what is grade 3 burns here what I have said, um, they generally heal, they heal with fibrosis and scarring and if it is a joint, they heal by contracture formation. And grade 4 as uh, it's very obvious that we have to excise the burn and put a graft or else they will heal by contracture or they will not heal at all uh, if it is in, uh, in between the joints. So. OPD management mainly focuses on superficial burns and grade 2 burns or superficial second degree burns. So, so generally what uh, in grade 1 burns and most important thing which even I also forgot to mention here is we have to educate people. Whenever we see, we see people coming with burns, they put all sorts of things, whatever they are available in there, toothpaste, turmeric, uh, what do you call it? Tomato sauce, huh? whatever it is, oil, everything they will put except water. Except water, everything they will put. I have seen some people uh, putting some tea powder, coffee powder, whatever they, whatever that is there, they will keep. So we have to educate people that if there is a burn, at least pour some water, immediately put under running water. That is the most important thing that we have to take. It decreases the intensity of the burns to a significantly low level by maybe more than 50% or sometimes even 90% effects of the burns will be uh, avoided. So the more the point time of contact, the more the depth of the burns. So that is how we have to uh, in the OPD management. This is not an OPD management because by the time you see in the OPD damage is already done. But that is how it is. So, in the superficial burns, generally we do dressings. There is no other. We just have to apply some uh, pain uh, soothing ointment. Generally, we I advise a wax-based ointment because they retain the moisture and keep the area wet. Or, I don't say wet, but it keeps the area moist, which is helpful for epithelization. It promotes a moist environment, always promote epithelization. And uh, generally, what we... Uh, use a small gauze or a, we have a norm, many dressings now, occlusive dressings where we get like a, a collagen, mepilex or many other biotin, many companies, you can just apply them. That will be fine. And coming to the next level, this is the most uh, common burns is grade 2 burns, especially superficial burns. They get confused with uh, either superficial or we tend to think it is more superficial but it is more deeper. So that is where we uh, generally advise uh, uh, collagen uh, sheet application 
that is where because the more the the more uh, the early you close the wound the early you cover it up the faster the epithelialization will be and uh, one thing is the more uh, uh, secondary healing happens the more chances of hypertrophic scarring also occur in burns so if you keep uh, these take maybe 2 to 3 weeks if it is superficial grade 2 burns they take 2 to 3 weeks time or 1 to 3 weeks time to heal so during that period there is a chance that there will be a secondary infection what we have noticed is most of the burns which heal by themselves by regular dressings they tend to develop hypertrophic scarring or keloids because chronic secondary infection of a sub or a, i don't say secondary infection or a chronic it's a sub clinical colonization or infection of the wound is a trigger for hypertrophic scarring and once there is a hypertrophic scar and it's very difficult to control or uh, uh, cure it so prevention is a better in hypertrophic scarring so early closure of the wounds is a uh, key for uh, prevention of uh, further complications and healing also so grade 2 burns we always advocate a collagen grafting because it closes the wounds this collagen sheet it stuck to the dermis and uh, helps in epithelialization and once the uh, dermis uh, epidermis is epithelialized uh, the collagen which, uh, sheet will peel off by itself so the same thing is which you can see it's happening here so this is an acute burn and here once uh, the uh, burns are healed so this collagen peels off slowly like this and uh, this is nothing like this is a uh, small uh, whatever thread coming out this is not related to the burns okay so this is how uh, the collagen peels off and more importantly next comes to soft tissue infections in case of soft tissue infections early recognition of uh, onset of compartment syndrome or all these things is uh, important in uh, uh, prevention of uh, further complications here recently in fact uh, it's a uh, our patient only we conserved we tried to uh, manage it by antibiotics it was not uh, uh, responding so we did a fasciotomy for both here in upper uh, in the leg as well as uh, uh, the thigh and as soon as we did a fasciotomy there was a dramatic improvement in his uh, symptoms so that what happens most of the times we tend to a little bit we tend to go a little bit uh, conservatively on uh, uh, opening up in a kid but uh, timely intervention timely opening up is a key in preventing the complications if i had not do, done this uh, this one the moment we stopped the antibiotic there is uh, because uh this infection would have increased and proximity to the joints would have lead into septic arthritis and septic arthritis leads to long term complications like joint stiffness joint fibrosis whatever you, uh, as dr rasaram uh, redigaru uh, pointed out in his previous uh, presentation that infections is very important and once it crosses certain level of uh, barrier then it becomes difficult to control them so as i told you uh, towards the end of the i've come to my end of my presentation so due diligence is very important in deciding when to operate or when to put a glue in uh, this one and staples as uh, it mentioned we generally don't use staples because staples appear very barbaric to us as a plastic surgeons okay so that putting a staple on a child's kid skin is like putting <laughs> we can't even imagine so so either we put a glue or we suture there is no role of staples in anything thank you very much thank you when i used to study and i used to say it's now only neosporin is only one which is wax based the all other tea bag nipros and everything is water based ointment only neosporin ointment is the one which is wax paraffin based not wax based it's paraffin based paraffin based that's all the things you don't get what are your favorite ointment silver x is a generally in a superficial burns smaller burns we give a neosporin only silver x is for a bigger one because silver causes local reaction of the skin a lot of for this one so if it is smaller uh, superficial burns grade 2a or grade 1 uh, i generally use uh, neosporin or mupirocin ointments generally and other, uh, silver based things like mega heal or silver based silver based nanocrystalline silver uh, silver ointment is good 
you can use it because that has a collagen base and uh, that's good. You can uh, go for that. These are, if the burns, generally burns, we generally use both. It depends on the extent of burns. If it is a small burn, we generally give a neosporin ointment. But if it is a bigger burn, like as I showed you in my presentation, if it's a bigger burn involving more than 10% or more than 5% of the surface area, then we go for a, a silver-based crystalline oil. Predominantly nanocrystalline silver with collagen base. That causes a better uh, behavior. It behaves better with skin rather than uh, uh, rough behavior. Because it's causing a lot of uh, pigmentation. Yes. Becomes a little ghastly sign for the parents. So they just get that's the thing. That is the reason why I uh, avoid for smaller because it, we don't want uh, things to be ghastly, look ghastly to the parents. Older Cinderex causes two issues, sir. One is blackish discoloration, other one is hypernatremia it can cause. Okay. Yeah. So now the current yeah. ones are non-ionic ones. So they are better but still it causes pigmentation. Uh, so mega heal doesn't cause that yes. and then neosporin doesn't cause that. Mega heal comes with a spray also. So some Rest all, see, whatever this, our uh, basic uh, idea is to cover the wound. Any wound, any ointment, see, uh, any superficial burns, basic idea of uh, uh, dressing is to cover the wound. So that, especially in superficial burns or grade 2 A burns, there will be an exposed nerve endings. So they cause a lot of uh, pain. So our aim of uh, dressing in uh, a burn is, to cover the wound so that the nerve and nerve endings get not uh, will not get stimulated or exposed and causing severe pain. So these antibiotic ointments or tuli grass ointment, everything is just an addition to prevent some infection. But our main aim is pain relief for the dressing, especially in uh, superficial respite. This is a added advantage or what you call a, a benefit of uh, closing. We put an ointment just to prevent some infection, which is unlikely in the superficial burns uh, going for an infection. It's mainly for pain relief. Our dressings are mainly for pain relief. Placenterex, placental extracts, these are all, as I told, plus, I don't say placebo. They have some growth factors among it. Uh, even placenterex and all these things. Even we use placenterex or uh, uh, region D ointment where we have a platelet derived growth factors. So all these growth factors help in uh, uh, epithelization. But immediate acute setting, immediately when we prevent infection, acute setting, we generally don't uh, use it because uh, our aim is to pain relief as well as some amount of prevention of infection. Yeah, once everything is settled, if you are feeling that the wound is not improving, then we go for uh, uh, these growth factor based ointments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Most of them will be scared to go to uh, again uh, cutter and all. So let's see a simple technique. So if you are able to pass one small thread underneath the ring which is stuck, that is enough. Okay. Most of the time we will be able to do, if you are in your OPDs, I'm sure we will have at least one needle, one thread. If not, we can ask the parents to bring it. And if you have a mosquito forceps or a dental floss, use that to thread the ring across that. Okay, underneath the ring, pass it on to the other side. And whatever is there distal to the ring, you start uh, putting like a, a knot. Not, not actually, continue to uh, rotate, rotate, rotate till you get it to the tip of your finger. Okay, am I clear? Pass the thread underneath the stuck ring to the proximal side, that is towards this side. And whatever is there, roll. After that, you start pulling out from this side. Okay, it easily comes. You can try on yourself, but ensure it's not very tight. Okay, because if you are stuck, you will curse me. Okay, uh, so once you do start rolling from the other end, it easily comes out. I'll just tell uh, the theory behind this uh, or the steps, uh, six steps, how you need to do. Pass one end using a fine string or a dental floss across and then you might need some help with a paper clip or something like that. And then with the other end, roll around and then pull it. Okay? If possible, I'll show you a video which I did uh, uh, for one child. I'll see if I can play on this. Okay? Right. Uh, meanwhile, we have uh, our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Jaydeepre Chaudhary, sir. If 
they respond well, these two medications, then things are good. If they don't respond, then you show that you will be having, uh, the child will go on having recurrent seizures. So, how we uh, select uh, the anti convulsants when a child comes to us with seizure? Obviously, the most important uh, thing is that we have to uh, understand what is the seizure simulology. It's a focal seizure or it's a general seizure or the onset is unknown. So, you are not able to find out by repeated history taking that whether uh, the, how is the onset. Sometimes uh, a video clip of the seizure may help at times. And so, if the parents can provide with a, a small video, it helps. And then, uh, so that's important to know about the epilepsy phenotype. What is the type of seizure, whether it's spasms or it's starting um, atonic falls and uh, what so. And then we know that uh, the children do have some age-related characteristics because there will be some children who have benign seizures um, uh, in the childhood and some can develop febrile conversions and some then over the time they develop some uh, syndromes uh, of seizure epilepsy. And epilepsy syndromes are a group of uh, epileptic disorder that are <coughs> characterized by certain uh, symptoms and we call it epilepsy syndrome. So we have to try to identify what is that and so we can choose a, a appropriate anti-epileptic drug. So, uh, so uh, when we uh, choose a drug, suppose a uh, child has come with one seizure, should we start a medication or we wait? So the dictum is that yes, uh, you first try to find out what is the recurrence how much will be the chance of recurrence. If the chance of recurrence is more than 60%, then go ahead with a medication. So, how to uh, know about the recurrence? Because uh, uh, the recurrence, we know by the point that if the child has one seizure and has an abnormal neurological examination or is an abnormal EEG or uh, he or she has an abnormal MRI or she is having nocturnal seizures. Now, all these uh, four points increases the chance of getting uh, the second seizure. So, if nothing is there like that, child has a seizure, normal MRI, normal EEG, no abnormal problems, it's not a nocturnal seizure, we can wait because it, the chance of recurrence is less. But if any one of these uh, factors are there in that, so the chance of recurrence is more and is more than 60%. And therefore, it uh, we have to choose an anti-epileptic drug. Now, uh, it is known that if we give an anti-epileptic medication uh, the, after the first seizure, it delays the second seizure. But it doesn't change the long-term outcome. But it definitely delays the second seizure and that's important. So, uh, factors that alter the approach is that uh, whether it's a benign problem or not. So, benign natural uh, um, seizures, that is Rolandic seizures or seizures with centrotemporal spikes that happens in night. And uh, occipital spiking uh, seizures, these are all happens mildly in the night and it's not very serious. And some parents are not willing to start on anti-epileptic drugs because of this condition. But sometimes uh, some uh, parents are uh, willing to start because they are worried. So, uh, we have to take uh, um, the opinion of the parents and our personal child. But we'll realize that it's a benign condition, it can go over after some time. And we all know that there is a problems of cognitive and behavior side effects. So a little hyperactive child to start in on levetiracetam will be a problem that we should know. And if the child is an obese and starting the child on uh, uh, sodium valproate may be a problem. So these uh, issues we have to keep in mind when we select the anti-epileptic treatment. And uh, uh, in adults we have a problem because adults, if the patients have a seizure, the problem is that whether he can drive or not. That's a problem. So, but in children that we don't have that issue. So that is not a very much uh, important concern when we deal with anti-epileptic drug selection in children. And uh, whether in some patients we can start anti-epileptic drugs before the seizures. Now that is uh, one thing that is uh, probably uh, explored in uh, patients who have uh, tubular sclerosis. And they have found that in uh, patients with tubular sclerosis, tubular sclerosis when they have epileptic spasms, uh, before the epileptic spasms, some children develop abnormal hip arrhythmia in EEG. Now when, if you treat those abnormal hip arrhythmias with uh, vigabatrin, it has been found that they don't uh, develop seizures and they uh, uh, get better and they are much better off cognitively also uh, if you can start the treatment before the onset of seizures. So that is only an uh, important example to uh, really look into the EEG patterns even before the seizures have come. So, uh, 
again selecting the uh, anti-epileptic drum we see whether it is focal generalized or mixed pattern or there is spasms it's an absence epilepsy or a myoclonic epilepsy and uh, we try to choose an anti-epileptic drug that has a broad or a narrow spectrum that means uh, some uh, ones uh, like oxcarbamazepine carbamazepine phenytoin they are narrow spectrum drugs they work mostly with uh, focal seizures whereas valproic acid levetiracetam are broad spectrum drugs they work in different types of seizures so that is uh, one uh, very important area that we should uh, understand and uh, we should take them um, which is effective for ethosuximide though a narrow spectrum drug we know that it's very effective in uh, absence seizures so we should choose a molecule that is very effective in that type of seizures we should know about the side effect profile and also sometimes it's useful to know the mechanism of action when you are trying to treat uh, suppose uh, two or three uh, anti-epileptic drugs because car ox carbamazepine carbamazepine phenytoin they work through the they block the fast sodium channels whereas lacosamide blocks the slow chone sodium channels similarly valproic acid mostly works through calcium channel and topiramate works through uh, ampa uh, channels and then uh, gabapentin augments uh, gabaergic uh, drive so like that uh, we have several uh, mechanism of actions for each of the anticonvulsants and probably like clobazam improves the glycine uh, inside the glycine transmission so this like way we uh, go ahead and try to give two anti-epileptic drugs with different mechanism action and again uh, forms and pills whether the child can take syrup and many things may not be available in syrup form and all, all those formulations are also important when you select an aim <clears throat> Uh, so uh, that we have already discussed the age and sex and all but sometimes we have to also understand about the allergy uh, because we know that lamotrigine or carbamazepine can cause allergic reactions like steven johnson syndrome and probably if you can do an hla b 1502 uh, if that is uh, present because it's common in asian ancestry uh, those children are more prone to develop uh, steven johnson similarly uh, valproid induced liver toxicity and severe liver toxicity is possible if the child is having a, a Paul G1 mutation. So these two things you can try if it is possible and if the parents are very worried about uh, having the side effects. And then uh, obviously the socioeconomic and personal preferences of the each treating uh, uh, pediatrician and cost availability and personal choice. These are the other uh, factors that we think uh, is very important to uh, think on these lines also when we select an AED. So, um, there are not much trials available that which is the best drug. Uh, recently, uh, there was a, not recently, around 8, 10 years back, there is a SANAT trial that is standard anti-epileptic drug therapy in epilepsy, which involved adult and pediatric patients. And they come with some formulation to tell us that, yes, probably lamotrigin is good and uh, than carbamazepine in focal epilepsy, while valproic acid is probably better than levetiracetamam in generalized epilepsy. So, uh, after uh, that study has shown us that this can be uh, the trend. <coughs> so children with partial seizures, uh, the first line of class A evidence is oxcarbamazepine, while the class C evidence we have with carbamazepine, phenobarbitone, uh, phenytoin, topiramate, uh, vigabatrin and valproic acid. And uh, last evidence, D evidence is uh, with <coughs> clobazam and clonazepam, lamotrigin and jonisamide. So this is uh, choice of anti-epileptic drugs when the child is having a focal seizure. And self-limited epilepsy with central uh, temporal spikes, it's self-limited, but they usually respond to uh, carbamazepine or valproic acid. And uh, sometimes very less, um, um, refractory patients we can give with uh, sultian. Children with uh, absence seizures, uh, um, yes, well, most evidence is available with ethosuximide and then probably valproic acid and uh, also we, we can use lamotrigin if required. And children with GTCS, your yeah, first drug of choice will be uh, valproic acid. Other choices will be uh, carbamazepine, uh, phenobarbitone, uh, yeah. <coughs> phen uh, phenytoin, topiramate and uh, low level may be oxcarbamazepine. So, uh, and uh, patients who have epileptic spasm, probably uh, they uh, do with uh, either steroids or with the Viga battery. Um, uh, it has been seen in a study that within 13 to 14 days, the spasm stops. Uh, if you give steroid at 72% patients will not have any 
spasms, followed by 54% in the gabapentin <coughs> group, and sustained spasm control, infantile spasm control, can be there up to 14 months, 40 and 37% in steroid and the vigabatrin group. So these are the two more major drugs that we use in patients with uh, uh, epileptic spasms. And so this is a patient who had, uh, we had a patient who had epileptic spasms and then he was treated with multiple medications. And uh, uh, we can see this uh, continuous uh, spiking is happening and there is a small uh, uh, lesion in, in the brain, probably a uh, heterotopia. And uh, so that uh, medications that we usually use are ACTH uh, followed by Vigabactrin or sometimes both can be given. Uh, other drugs are topiramide, jonisamide, ketogenic diet and sometimes uh, in one patient we have to do a PET scan, found out there are some uh, lesions which are the areas that are getting highlighted in a PET scan in patients with uh, continuous epileptic spasms and people have done surgery although on those lesions, a focal lesion surgery uh, in uh, uh, some selected patients. Absent seizures, we usually treat, uh, treat with ethosuximide, we can use valproic acid, and third, we can use lamotrigine if required. Lennox gastrostinoid is a difficult uh, epilepsy to treat. Actually, they have multiple seizure types, and they have tonic seizure, atonic seizure, tonic clonic seizure, tonic atonic seizures, falls, non motor seizures, atypical absences, and sometimes they can have uh, non convulsive status epilepticus. So, it's a multiple uh, basket of many types of seizures that comes in. And it's difficult to treat. First, the first line probably will be valproic acid followed by lamotrigine. And uh, rufinamide is not available, but um, it used to get available earlier in uh, one of the pharmacies. We have used it in uh, two or three patients like that. And then uh, other medications are topiramate, clobazam, felbamate, and sometimes cannabinol. So they have found a report that, uh, that cannabinol is also useful in this type of patients. Ketogenic diet, vagal nerve stimulation, a resection and callosotomy are the extreme uh, measures to treat uh, these uh, Renox gastric. And uh, then Dr. Suresh told me about how, that, uh, how to uh, use the midazolam nasal spray. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, basically uh, it can be given in children uh, at home by the parents before they shift uh, to the hospital and uh, when they have a seizure. Uh, they have been trialed and they found that probably giving uh, IM midazolam is probably better in patients who have febrile convulsion or in, uh, before they shift to the hospital and it's better than uh, giving IV lorazepam uh, because the sedation and all other parts are not so uh, profound with the IM midazolam. So midazolam nasal spray is a simple method that can be used by opening the nozzle and putting in one puff in each nose. Uh, uh, one, once, uh, once you can use the puff there and then uh, you can put it and next uh, in both the nostrils uh, in one go and then wait uh, you can repeat it if there is an older child and sometimes uh, we prefer to put the lip down and put some puffs under the tongue that also seems to work so these are the ways you can manage the, um, these uh, patients it's not a very long lecture because uh, we just wanted to go, touch upon the practical points. Thank you for patient hearing. This is my last step. And there are the guidelines that uh, we know that whether uh, first seizure, because uh, whether you treat the first seizure or not, or we wait for a recurrence, and depends. It's a, several levels of issues with parents, type of seizure, and all. I think um, uh, pediatrician should start the treatment. It's not a neurologist uh, cup of tea what also. Uh, leveratism is a, yeah, probably it's uh, more or less uh, uh, availability, easy, and uh, it has a less good side effect profile, and it's a broad spectrum anti-convulsant. So uh, it has been used widely, but clinical data of leveratism in children is not so much available. So it's an all, all data from adult uh, data that has been uh, transferred to children. Point which Levert Rosetta has earlier mentioned is uh, hyperactivity, and uh, you know, and nowadays we are as such seeing a lot of hyperactive kids. So, if already a child is hyperactive, or there is some component, then it is uh, better to consider other alternatives. But it is a very good drug in when you are uh, managing status epilepticus child. 
because there is no restriction of uh, doing it very slow. You can slow bolus IV infu- uh, push you can give for peptoin, phenobarbital. We have to wait 20 minutes until that time the child keeps seizing. So it's uh, in that sense, yes, levetiracetam after the initial lorazepam dosages, metazolam, levetiracetam has got a great role. But I think neurologists will be the better people to you know think whether levetiracetam will be good or not in the particular child. I don't know, you people tell me, I, you don't use, I mean, all pediatric uh, epilepsy, you must be using the levaratism, all valproate or... What happens, sir, once they come, you know, that's the yes. then they eventually get levetiracetam. And, uh, and on that, they get controlled, so then that gets carried on. That's how they end up, I mean, most of the pediatric uh, patients will have levetiracetam as such. Because the casualty medical officers are very fond of that, because it's easy to give and doesn't produce yes. sedation. Uh, no issues with regards to any cardiac arrhythmias as, as we see in Epstein. No issues with regards to respiratory depression. So these are the things which we are worried in a child who is actively seizing. Yes. And add to it in OPD practice, what happens is this is one drug which causes a side effect which is perceived as normal, hyperactivity. <laughs> Most parents think my child is hyperactive. They will never attribute that to levetra setup. Yeah. Or uh, hepatitis. Uh, or gum hypertrophy. Uh, Anybody will choose hypertrophy. Uh, that's what is happening, sir. That's what I'm seeing in last few years. Uh, I don't know if it is overrated drug in pediatrics. Now the younger one, Brevipil, has come. Uh, it's just that it's little expensive and they are claiming side effect profile in children is better. We don't know. Uh, but we are seeing a lot of children with hyperactivity. And when we point it out, parents say, my child is always hyperactive.